very pleased to be here to introduce our second plenary speaker of the afternoon, Professor Alice Conklin from Ohio State University. We're very pleased that Alice has been able to be here with us. Many of you will be familiar with Alice's work. She is the author of two very important books uh, on the French imperial experience in the late modern period. Her first book, a Mission to Civilize, a Republican Idea of Empire in France and West Africa. There are dates attached, 1890 to 1930, okay. possibly. Yes. Um, is the first book that I make my final year undergraduate special subject class on French imperialism read, and it's one of those seminal books that defines a turning point. We'll put we'll, we'll a turning point in here. It's one of those books that defines and marks a turning point in its discipline, and that was one of the sort of founders of a group of historians doing what we sometimes call the new colonial history, thinking in interesting and innovative ways about the relationship between metropolitan France and overseas France, and between republicanism and empire. Most recent, and among many other things, Alice has recently published a, a book on French ethnography and anthropology entitled The Museum of Man, um, which I think it provides some of the material for your talk today, Alice. I won't uh, go on at great length by listing a number of other good things that Alice has done. Um, except to say that whereas um, it was very easy, I think, to find turning points in French history leading up to 1815, I don't think we uh, have such obvious turning points in the political sense after 1815. So I think what Alice is giving us is more a sense of people and ideas changing over time rather than a uh, point at which the world changes. I'm intrigued to hear what you have to say anyway, Alice, so thank you very much. We're looking forward to hearing you. Thank you, Stephen, for that um, very generous welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank the Society for bringing us all together today and, and for their generosity in bringing me here. Uh, to speak this afternoon. Of course, um, we all want to thank Professor Guy Rowlands for <laughs> doing such a wonderful job with the logistics. It's been flawless so far. Okay, my, my talk this afternoon is, is framed partly around the story of Germaine Tillon. Let me put a picture. A French ethnographer who spent a total of 36 months between 1935 and 1940 among the Berber-speaking Shawiya tribes in the remote Ores Mountains of Algeria, the same Ores Mountains from which the Algerian Revolution would be launched in 1954. Returning to France in 1940, Tillon, then a graduate student, joined the resistance immediately, was betrayed and imprisoned, and eventually deported to Ravensbrück with her mother. Her mother was gassed, but Germaine survived, and she went on to become one of her country's most committed witnesses to the Holocaust, determined to let the world know what had happened, and to fight for the punishment of those responsible. She later became an outspoken critic of torture during the Algerian War, and lived to celebrate her 100th birthday before her death in 2008. I'd like to begin with a quote from her. In her 2000, um, her memoir published in 2000, Germaine Tillon uh, wrote, and the title of the memoir was Il était une fois l'ethnographie. She wrote, in 1934, in the Algerian Ores, the events of 1954 were unimaginable, even for people who were well informed, which I was not. But I was genuinely Republican like the great majority of my compatriots, and I considered all humans equal. Germaine Tillon's extraordinary courage and commitment to combating injustice in the dark 20th century in France and the world was recognized recently when she, along with three other members of the resistance, Jean Zay, Geneviève Antonius de Gaulle, and Pierre Brosselet, were, were pantheonisés, as the French say, placed in the Pantheon as Republican heroes in Paris in May, uh, just a few weeks ago. This is a, a picture of um, the Pantheon in Paris with, these are only the two, two of the four big, um, very handsome portraits that were put up in honor of the four resistors. How do we account for such moral clarity? 
History can help us to understand under what circumstances particular acts of courage by intellectuals emerge and why. But does it allow us to draw larger conclusions about, say, the history of anti-racism in a place like France before, during, and after a race war of the magnitude of World War II? I will throw caution to the wind and say yes, a single life seen in context may indeed prove rich in instruction. Tillon's student years are especially revealing. From 1932 until her arrest in 1942, she was part of the remarkable cluster of French ethnologists centered around the Musée de l'Homme and the Institut d'Ethnologie at the Sorbonne. Under the leadership of the sociologist of the primitive, the Durkheimian Marcel Mauss, he was Durkheim's nephew, and the physical anthropologist and linguist Paul Rivet, the members of this group sought to render the study of humanity in its fundamental sameness, but also in its linguistic, cultural, and racial diversity, more unified and more scientific than was true in the France of their day. The fledgling discipline of ethnology, or ethnology as they called it, attracted a striking number of pioneering intellectuals in the years from 1926 to 1940. In addition to Germaine Tillon, the cohort included the future Gaullist and Governor General of Algeria in 1955, Jacques Soustel, the future head of UNESCO's Race Study Bureau, founded in 1950, Alfred Métro, and André Leroy Gouron, a French archaeologist, paleontologist, paleoanthropologist, and anthropologist with an interest in technology and aesthetics and a penchant for philosophical reflection. And that's a direct quote from his Wikipedia entrance, uh, uh, entry. And my, po my point is these were all quite brilliant iconoclasts who are very hard to pigeonhole. And I've mentioned just a few of them here. Several of this cohort joined the resistance and the free French, and many, the most talented, lost their lives in it. The Musée de l'Homme itself was home to one of the first organized resistance movements in France, which was subsequently betrayed. The Nazis executed two of the Réseau's ethnologists in 1942, Anatole Levitsky and Boris Villet, and they deported a third member, Yvonne Odon, the Musée de l'Homme librarian. In addition, ethnologist Deborah Lipschitz was deported because she was Jewish and died at Auschwitz. In what follows, I would like mostly to explore possible connections between the pursuit of a career in ethnology in 1930s France and the choice to join the resistance, but also to say a few words about the post-World War II trajectory of anti-racism that this generation helped to shape. My initial focus will be on the role that the teaching of Marcel Mauss and the experience of fieldwork in French North Africa played in the training of a student such as Germaine Tillon, as well as a number, another member of her cohort, Charles Lecoeur, who fought and died uh, with the Free French. Then I will turn to Jacques Soustel as a kind of counterexample. Soustel was not a close student of Mauss. He did his 1930s fieldwork in Mexico before joining de Gaulle in London in 1940. He would end up in Algeria with Germaine Tillon in January 1955. There's a picture of de Gaulle, um, of, de Gaulle of Soustel, Freudian slip, uh, Soustel in, uh, in Algeria in 1955. At this point, the two former classmates made, began to make radically different choices. She against torture, he eventually for the OAS and the terrorist campaign to preserve l'Algérie Française. This is a picture of Soustel in 1961 in Paris. I don't know if anyone can recognize the large person to his left. That would be Jean-Marie Le Pen. 
I think I'll move him off. <laughs> I have chosen to, I have chosen to approach the theme of this conference, Turning Points in French History, around the story of 20th century ethnologists and their political engagements in matters where race, although not only race, was at stake, for two reasons. First, the joint struggle by a small number of students and professors alike to refound la science de l'homme, as it's often called in France, in Paris in the interwar years has not adequately been recognized. Second, individuals contributing to the establishment of a new field of knowledge based on the premise that all races are equal might also have been predisposed to risk their lives first against the Nazis and then later in the struggle to end colonialism. Yet if the case of Germain Tillon fits this comforting scenario, that of Soustel obviously does not. Perhaps the direction in which these two resistors evolved after the war reflects where they each imbibed their anti-racism as field workers. Let me start by looking at one of Moses' own most productive ideas, his reflections on nationalism and the race concept after World War I. And I begin with Mose because he was the intellectual life force of the Institute of Ethnology, founded to develop the ethnographic and linguistic branches of anthropology in France. Mose himself was an armchair anthropologist since he himself never undertook field work. He insisted that his students do so. Nevertheless, as an assimilated Jew in a still largely Catholic and anti-Semitic France, who traveled regularly out to his deeply religious family home in Lorraine, as an active socialist, and as a member of the international cooperative movement in the 1920s, most had ample field encounters of his own in France to help guide his disciples. In his work and in his teaching, most sought to comprehend the deep, deep history of human societies, principally through comparison of social facts. These facts were three orders, linguistic, material, and symbolic. The point was not only to understand every society on its own terms, but also to compare societies to illuminate both what all human groups had in common and the particularity of social rules developed by each culture. So-called primitives offered unique social facts that were fast disappearing in the face of modern globalization. Most developed these ideas concretely after World War I, whose useless bloodletting led him, led him to pay new attention to two categories of societies, nations and civilizations. And in his discussion of both, most who rarely wrote directly on race, came very close to a constructionist understanding of the term. A nation, most argued, was a particular kind of integrated society, characterized by a stable and permanent government, central government, fixed frontiers, and a relative moral, mental, and cultural unity among its inhabitants who consciously adhered to the state and its laws. Nothing new here for a good Republican. But he then went on to clarify that while a modern nation believes in its race, its language, and its civilization, in fact, the first and third of, of these are creations of the nation, not vice versa. In some, and here I quote, it is because the nation creates the race that it is thought that the race creates the nation. Moses' inversion of the essentialist race-nation relationship in turn begged the larger question. If nations invented their racial origins and their civilizations, then how in fact did a nation come into being? To simplify, nations formed through intra-social contacts. No society exists alone in the world. And he continued, quote, historically and today more than ever, societies are formed from each other, end quote. Moreover, the common elements which particular societies come to share through the circulation of peoples, objects, and ideas form civilizations. Societies are thus immersed in a share of pooled civilization, which shapes these society, what shapes these societies are their borrowings and their refusals to borrow. But either way, it is partly what is outside of them that forms any given society's culture, not some organic essence. 
such an implicit attack on those ideologues of the interwar years who were racializing the nation and Moses' use of ethnology to bolster his arguments would have a decisive influence on the new generation of students who came to him in the 1920s. His anthropological concepts provided a research program and an intellectual framework that allowed them to see archaic others, and archaic was Moses' favorite word to describe non-Western peoples, archaic others as equal historical agents in which a consideration of race was irrelevant. Five of Moses' students in ethnology took his lessons particularly to heart. Germaine Tillon, Charles Lecoeur, Bernard Maupoil, Maurice Leinhardt, and Denise Paul. The first three actively resisted, and neither Maupoil nor Lecoeur survived the war. For these five, the transition from Moses' courses to the field seems to have been relatively straightforward. We're used to thinking of field work or participant observation as a radical act of decentering. But again, the record suggests that many of this cohort had a remarkable capacity to identify the other as familiar. In particular, these students showed a strong propensity to historicize the social phenomenon they were discovering and analyzing in specifically most in terms. If most societies exist in a pool of civilization, what past and current exchanges had made the people they were studying what they were? For the five most sins on the screen, this approach paved the way for observing and dissecting not only pre-colonial forms of social cohesion, but also the more recent historical fact of colonialism and its destabilizing effects, even in field sites chosen precisely for their purported isolation from the West. And it's not a coincidence that someone like Thiel was in the most remote corner of Algeria in the highest mountains because she did not want to be anywhere close to France as she understood it. Now, I'm not so naive to think that a close ethnographic encounter with a colonized other supervised from afar by Marcel Mous was a predictor of future resistance. But in the two cases I wish to examine, those of Lecoeur and Tillon, doing fieldwork in North Africa in the 1930s does seem to have expanded their capacity for empathy in ways that made a struggle against racialized forms of injustice and inequality more likely. Lecoeur was perhaps the most sociologically minded of Moses' students in ethnology, the one he hoped would be his heir. From 1928 to 1938, he taught at the Collège Musulman in Rabat, Morocco. So there you see him with um, another teacher there and his staff, before publishing his thesis under Moses' direction, entitled Rituals and Tools in the late 1930s. Still in Morocco in 1943, he asked to join the Free French Army, participated in the liberation of Italy, where he was killed in July 1944. Lecoeur's thesis was quite eclectic. It combined an ethnography of a small city, Moroccan city, Azemur, not too far from Casablanca, from which many of his middle-class Muslim students came. Combined that with a second ethnography of the Teda ethnic group herdsmen, you see up here in a mountainous corner of northern Chad in the Sahara. The Curve's thesis also included a critical reading of several classical theorists of political economy, including Smith, Marx, Proudhon, and Simeon. The thesis begins by Le Curve invoking his own radical rejection of colonialism in the 1920s when he was a militant student flirting with neo-socialism in Paris. It ends, somewhat surprisingly, by paying homage to the colonial policies of Marshal Hubert Lyotet, who uh, was the resident general in the Protectorate of Morocco from 1912 to 1925. For Lecoeur, Lyotet was more revolutionary than Peter the Great, Stalin, or Hitler. And this is what he writes in his thesis. On the one hand, Lyotet had supposedly endowed Morocco with a rationalized economy. On the other, 
He had also been a partisan of more ancient forms of civilization there. Had he not made the sultan and the maksan, which is the traditional uh, government there, an essential part of the constitution of the protectorate. Such a policy was driven not, and here I quote Le Coeur, by excessive rationality, the besetting sin of the West, but a capacity also for love. All civilized elements in Morocco had breathed this new air, and Le Coeur concluded, here I quote, as long as the humblest Moroccan, Arab, French, Berber, Jew, and Spaniard, keeps alive the flame that pushes each man to love in another, that which is most personal, that which makes him him and not some other, he will be preserved from the ravages of nationalism or worse still, a leveling internationalism that appeals to some far away brother to crush the ostensible foreigner at home. Now, what are we to make of such flights of rhetoric about a protectorate further consolidated in the wake, after all, of the bloody Rif War? Well, first, Le Coeur believed that ethnographic knowledge methodically acquired and properly acted upon could check unbridled exploitation in the empire. This said, scientific knowledge alone was not enough. Science helps one to know, but politics, the art of governing, also requires, and here I'm paraphrasing Le Coeur, love. 1930s racism operated on exactly the opposite principle. It reflected an exclusive reliance on racial science in which a certain kind of knowledge was mobilized and obviously perverted to justify a politics of death. Second, and related, the productive shock of his own encounter with the Teda as well as the inhabitants of Azemur confirmed for Le Coeur that preserving differences was essential to humanity's moral survival. In the Europe of the 1930s in which he was writing, the two most important threats on the horizons appeared to be fascism, which celebrated racial purity, and Bolshevism, which celebrated class purity. In this mixture of hatreds sanctioned by science, late French colonialism under a visionary like Lyoté seemed to offer a ray of hope. How Le Coeur would have felt about decolonization had he lived is, of course, impossible to know. Let me turn now to Germaine Tillon. She offers another example of identification with her field subjects in a similarly lucid but hardly, hardly hostile view of colonialism during her fieldwork years. As I noted earlier, she spent several years in the Ores Mountains among the Shawiya of eastern Algeria, only to return to France in 1940 and immediately form one of the first resistance groups. Her thesis was either lost or destroyed when she was deported to Ravensbrück. What we have left of her original 1930s observations is pretty thin. Some field reports, some correspondence with most. These fragments do, however, reveal Tillon's respect for the Shawiya, which in turn produced friendship and trust, to the point where she housed and fed several of them when they came to Paris in 1938. Her correspondence with Mose in 1939 reflected a keen sense of this lived reciprocity, unusual, as she notes, in the unequal power relations of ethnographic observation under colonialism. Here I quote, all the Shawiya that I put up, as well as their families, their allies, their supporters, this is what she's writing to Mose upon her, her own return to the Ores, welcomed me enthusiastically. These people don't often get the chance to offer hospitality to one of us. I see arriving honey, grapes, peaches, tomatoes, melons, corns, grains. I know what potlatch means, and I am acting accordingly. End of quote. Now, Tillon accepted French rule as a given and believed in la paix française that the French had brought to the Ores, an area whose tribes, she noted, had since the fall of Rome been constantly at war. But in observing the changes that colonization had introduced, she was also able to criticize the French for their insensitivity to local values and the misguided policies that had ensued. 
So here we have Germain Tillon, what looks like in her pajamas in the Oras. Uh, interesting that the French flag is flying above, above her tent. She's alone, <laughs> relatively alone um, in this particular case, though. There were two who, women who traveled together, Thérèse Rivière and Tignon, so that's why we have photographs of Tignon. <laughs> her, um, her assigned ethnographic task was to establish a kinship map of all the Shawiya groups, but what emerged in, in tandem from her pen over the course of three years is a litany of historical transformations before and since colonization. Both undercut the very idea that les Oresiens had ever existed in any pure state. These notes were sent to Tion's advisors and the International Association for the Study of African Languages and Cultures, which was financing her field work, so of course must be read with a grain of salt. But what strikes me is that these notes are in no way self-censored. For example, in one of her reports, Tion was honest enough to admit that upon coming to Algeria, she had been, and I quote, a bit influenced by the negative press on North African natives, a prejudice which my passage through Algiers and then the colonial town of Biskra had only reinforced, end of quote. The fact is, she continued, I found a very honorable percentage of sincerity, thoughtfulness, appreciation, honesty, and even lack of selfishness both among evolved natives and the others. One of her earliest observations was that in an area as poor as the Ores, the onset of the depression after the good times of the 20s was having a worse effect on French attitudes toward Algerians than vice versa. World War I, she wrote, had greatly enriched the Ores. Benefits were paid to the families of the veterans. The return of peace had enriched the region even further thanks to the number of workers who went to France where they made up to 30 francs a day, in which, of which they spent practically nothing. As a result, they had bought back settler farms, which accounted for the latter's resentments toward them. Whereas in the relatively recent past, it had been possible to live under the radar, so to speak, of the French authorities, by the 1930s, even the remote, most remote areas of the Ores could no longer do so. Everyone, Tillon noted, was re resigned now to the fact of French presence. As a result, she claimed, le français ne gêne plus. To the contrary, he is sometimes a source of profits, almost always a source of company for the most evolved natives, often someone who gives useful advice, a free doctor, a friend. And there she's um, giving eye drops to a woman whose eyes are infected. Almost all the natives were happy to send their sons to school, she continued. It would be, she concluded, misguided, however, to see here the, and this is a quote, let's imitate the strengths of the French in order to beat them at their own game attitude that we ascribe to Asians. The pull towards French schools in the Ores is much more naively the taste for better living than an innocent form of snobbery. In yet another report on the evolution of the Ores, Tillon noted how easy it was to look at the very real traditionalism that remained and imagine that nothing was changing. The gamin who was playing his flute and guarding the goats, one thinks of ancient Greece or imagines a biblical scene. To do so, however, she continued, was to miss the awareness of even remote shepherds to the most apparently distant political developments. They were, for example, following in detail the ins and outs of the Italian war in Ethiopia and were equally well informed about what was going on in Algiers, Constantine, Tunis, and Oran. In short, native society was in full evolution. Most notable, perhaps, was the divorce Tillon saw occurring between the French-educated elite living a l'Européenne, the emergence of a reformed, purified Islam, and the resistance to both by common folk deeply attached to their marabou, or religious leaders, who monopolized prestige at the local level. For Tillon, the reformed Islam, what she called Wahhabisme, taking root in Algeria, resembled nothing more than the 18th century French search for a reasonable religion. It was led by the sons of the marabou themselves, since, and again I quote, monks invent religious revolts and aristocracies launch revolutions. She had a keen sense of history. 
Paris, meanwhile, ignored or looked down on the new elite it had educated. There would be, she warned, presciently conflicts in the future between religious reformers and the political movement of the young asking for greater assimilation. In a quite clear criticism of her government, she concluded that it was, after all, quite curious to see the Ores, whose standard of living had hardly changed over several millennia, now evolving outside of French control in the least visible but perhaps most fundamental of ways. Tillon, unlike Le Coeur, survived the war and returned to Algeria for the first time in 1954 as a mediator in the bloody conflict that had just erupted. Yet another one of her teachers, Louis Massignon, an Orientalist scholar, asked her if there was nothing she could do to help bring dialogue to a rapidly deteriorating situation. Tio embarked on a tour of the country and was shocked by the immiseration that she discovered as she traveled, unthinkable, she insisted, in 1934. She nevertheless took until 1958 to accept the need for independence, and even then she refused to take sides in the conflict, preferring to help her friends whichever side they were on. In an interview later in life, and, and Tillon was more or less forgotten about until the, the 1990s when she then started giving a lot of interviews, which ultimately ended with her Pantheonisation. In an interview later in life, she was asked about something she'd written in 1959. And in that year, she wrote a book entitled L'Afrique bascule vers l'avenir. The term indigène, when it referred to Algerians, Tillon stated, had always bothered her because of its pejorative connotations. In the interview, Tillon explained that she herself was deeply indigène, or indigenous, meaning that I am intensely from the place where I live. I am really a part of this community. I am indigenous from France, with all the shortcoming that such a statement contains. I am indigenous from here, but I leave, believe this status has a positive consequence. As an indigenous person, I understand other indigenous people who are indigenous from elsewhere. When further pressed if indigène meant belonging, she answered that, and I quote, it means understanding one's milieu. It means a certain solidarity with that milieu. And it also means partitions. It includes divisions that separate you a bit. End of quote. While it is difficult to know exactly what Tillon was set trying to say here, I would argue there is a certain consistency between these statements and the earlier self revealed in her field notes. Her attachment to France is obvious, as is her assumption that anyone who is committed to their community can understand the attachment of another committed to their different community. Interestingly, in the same interview, she defended the French language and to some extent its superiority to Arabic as a language worth learning. Arabic is a splintered tongue in the sense that its many different versions and dialects throw up barriers even within national communities. But behind every French teacher, this is still Tillon talking, there is an enormous cultural system to support that teacher always. What provides entry into this massif is the French language and all that it contains. And the language, Tillon continued, contains a great deal. The French Revolution, the rights of man, the rejection of slavery, an entire group of coherent ideals. It is a huge coherence that is the French coherence. And this is something precious. Tillon's claims here rightly make us uncomfortable. And yet, if we return to the 1930s, neither she nor Le Coeur can be slotted as complacent colonialists, conventional patriots, or blind universalists. They seem to have reveled in their ethnographic displacement and to have spent longer than most of that generation in the field, forging bonds with their subjects, Career goals mattered little to them, personal relations a great deal. How different, one is tempted to say, from that other résistant ethnologue from the 1930s, Jacques Soustel, who arrived in Algeria in January 1955. He worked with Tillon for that one year he was there, 
and whose name is thus often linked to hers. Now, Soustel, like Tillon, was a Gaullist de la première heure, although he went to London and then on to Algeria with de Gaulle in 1943. Soustel is best remembered for being a brilliant expert on pre-Columbian cultures, here you have him with, uh, with um, Malraux, André Malraux, um, in his position as, as expert, art historian. And he's also, of course, remembered as a diehard supporter of l'Algérie Française. I'll just put that up to remind you. <laughs> How to explain that two ethnologists formed in the same interwar institutions made such different choices later on. My working hypothesis is that Soustelle was certainly never a biological racist, indeed I would not call him a racist in any sense, never imbibed deeply in the Mosian well as a student, nor did he do field work in a French colony, which might have taught him to see Algerians and Africans as historical agents in their own right, rather than as blank slates, much less developed than the pre-Columbian societies of the past that he had studied, and that's the sense you get from reading um, Soustelle in the 50s and 60s, that he does not, he makes this, this unfavorable comparison between Africa, which has no history, and, um, and the Americas, which have a rich pre-Columbian history. Soustelle was the favored student of Paul Rivet, Moses' colleague, and Rivet was a physical anthropologist by training, later a linguist specializing in Amerindian languages, of South America. That is to say, he was not a comparative sociological thinker in the, in the mold of Moose. Although I need to do a deeper reading of Soustelle's trajectory to understand and sustain this argument, it seems that Soustelle, first as an ethnologist and later as a politician, never moved behind a, beyond a kind of essentialist cultural evolutionism in which, as late as the 1960s, he believed the African and Muslim peoples of France's colonies still needed to remain part of France if they were ever to become modern. At the risk of taking something completely out of context, let me conclude by reading one of Soustelle's statements from mid-November 1954 when he was a Gaullist deputy in an article entitled De l'Empire à la République fédérale. He began by noting that in matters of empire at a time when anti-colonialist sentiment was growing among the Americans, the Soviets, and the leaders of the Arab League, not one of these three had a right to give France lessons. The Soviets were quashing independence movements among their ethnic minorities by labeling them bourgeois nationalisms. The United States had exterminated most of their indigenous peoples and was one of the zones on the planet where racial discrimination against les gens de couleur was the most intense. And the Arab leaders spent most of their time imprisoning and shooting each other while the filayin, the mass of the peasantry, wallowed in the most in unimaginable <coughs> poverty. These hypocrisies, he continued, did not mean that France didn't have to reform its own union, as the former empire was now called but it would be dangerous to wait for solutions to fall into our lap. Said solutions, and here I quote Soustelle, could only derive from our reason and our energy. To govern is to choose. So with all respect to Soustelle, I believe that both Le Coeur and Tillon would have disagreed. Good governance anywhere required not only energy and reason, but the ability to understand, respect, and indeed love the governed. If patriotism combined with anti-racism moved an ethnologist like Soustelle to resist in France in 1940, perhaps an additional key to Thiel's continued life and resistance was the many friendships that she forged early on among the Shawiya of Algeria. These fr friendships were premised, like Le Coeur's affection for his students and for the Teda herdsmen, on the Mosian insight that reciprocity among different peoples has ensured not only survival, but granted meaning to life. Any ideology and any politics that have maintained other, that maintain otherwise had to be opposed in the name of humanity itself. 
As a final coda to my talk, let me just say that when François Hollande described Germaine Tillon at the Panthéonisation Ceremony on May 27th, he noted, and I quote, that son, son courage, il est intellectuel. Elle est la voix du savoir et de la connaissance. Well, yes and no. Her scientific erudition was more a form of what I would call sagesse, wisdom, open to the world while still very French. So as we collectively search for ways to contain the racism that daily haunts our headlines, Tillon's path to justice, liberty, and human equality was straighter than most. Not perfect, but straighter than most. Meanwhile, while she ended up in the Panthéon, Soustel fled the country in 1961. He was pardoned in 1968. Here we have quite a studied, I think, portrait of Soustel in exile. And he was made an academicien in 1983, um, often seen as more a bastion of the right than of the republic. His, for, his full story has yet to be told. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed, Alice. Thank you very much indeed for a really, a really rich portrait and a fascinating group of individuals who, who find themselves living through some really important intellectual and political turning points. I think that's given us a lot to think about. We have some time for questions. Can I invite questions from the floor? Uh, for Professor Powell. Um, absolutely fascinating talk. I really, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I just like to, you know, it's, it's, it's how, asking, ask you how you approach sort of the question of individual choices, because one could one could argue that people with certain temperaments, certain principles, seek out certain experiences, mm -hmm. certain forms of training, rather than that training itself being responsible for the choices mm -hmm. in the direction they later make. I was wondering how you. You know, in, in, in looking in such detail at these lives, you know, what what moves you to sort of privilege the the train, the you know, particularly their anthropological, ethnological experience over other other factors that, that might that might have been into shaping these choices. And particularly, I was wondering if you could. I mean, one one thing which I which I found sort of interestingly absent from the talk is politics. Mm -hmm. the, the you know, for, for you know, particularly in France in the 1930s, a country suffused by ideology. I mean, what, what were the political backgrounds, the familial political backgrounds of these people? Um, are there differences there that might have also played in? Uh, were there party memberships? There, I mean, you say that Tion and, and Sustel are, are Gaullists, Gaullists, but Gaullists is a very sort of broad, you know, sort of ideological envelope that often had many different mm -hmm. camps within it. So I was wondering if you could sort of you just reflect on those two questions. I mean, it's not meant not as criticism, it's wonderfully rich. Talk, but I mean, it, it leads to, sort of, for me, to questions like that. No, no, I, I appreciate the questions, and I think um, it, it's very hard to say that their training alone predicted in any way any of this. I just thought it, it and it's, it's because I probably began with a generation that trained, that was doing ethnology, and then one of the things that they seemed to have in common was a, a particularly um, rich history of acting. Um, well, joining the resistance, but which I also saw as coming out of, of, a, of a community, that they themselves formed a community, um, or some of them did. And it was this community that, that I suppose, like any group of, um, as in their case, they were intellectuals, but they were graduate students. They were working towards something, and they had no career perspectives because there were absolutely no positions o available to them. So they, they had a particularly strong sense of identity as a group because they were doing something innovative. And, and then they all were sort of lost. Many of them, most of them were lost to anthropology, either because they died in the war or because they made choices like Soustelle, who went into a political... So um, Soustelle's not did not make it into the book as one of the sort of cohort that I saw as really belonging, as you see, to the people who were influenced, I think, strongly by Moose. And, and he's the most political animal of all of them. I mean, he was, he was a, a, a Marxist internationalist. He had the, the sort of the convictions, the anti-communism by the 50s and 60s. I mean, we're now talking about the Cold War context, too, which I left out, and that's absolutely critical. And, 
in, in, in Sustel's case, but his anti-communism, he has that, the ferocity of someone who once was a believer, and that may partly help explain some of, of his... Um, but I think that it's it, it sort of interesting, that he in particular is interesting because um, he clearly, he was the youngest um, Normalien to arrive first in the aggregation of philosophy or something. I mean, he was always a, an incredibly ambitious and talented person. And I think he, he sort of missed his career, you know, by, he, he backed the wrong, he made the wrong choice in Algeria in particular. I mean, he had this sort of, sort of a Malraux quality about him, but I think he, so Soustelle is, is, is truly enigmatic. I mean, he, he has a political life in a way that, that Tion absolutely did not. She was, you know, she was not Gaulist by conviction. It was just sort of, she had no political um, involvement that I can see, unlike someone like Lecoeur, who's, who was, I mentioned, was publishing in neo-socialist papers in the, in the 30s, and who was very consciously engaged as an intellectual and thinking through political economy and questions of, of, of the impact of colonialism on local economies. And that, that I think he also got from someone like, like Mose. And who knows what would have... His thesis was published after the war by, by Ballandier, who's an, who did stay on as a, a very important African sociologist, the first sort of Afri- uh, an Africanist who who analyzed urban poverty, you know, and who sort of was interested in, in contemporary Africa and it's, and it's changing. So there, I think the, this is probably more than you need to hear, but French anthropology has also often been represented by, by Marcel Griol, who is sort of seen as this person who, who was actually very pro-union, pro-empire, not a very interesting thinker in the sense of, of most, because... He was the one who was looking for the timeless past, and it seems to me that people always associate him with French anthropology when there was this much more interesting, and I would say, uh, I mean, Creole was brilliant too, but in a different way. So the, the question of individual choice, I, I you know, I, I, unless you do biography, I'm not sure how you, um, or perhaps intellectual biography, um, you know, that becomes one way of telling a person's life that obviously counts for all sorts of possibility and changes over time. But I very deliberately went back to Soustel and, and read for, first of all, what he published in the 30s, because there's been some very interesting work done, both by Stephen and Todd Shepard on, on Soustel, um, who adopted a policy of integration at the end of, of, of 58 to 60, you know, a sort of, seems a very progressive sort of affirmative action, you know, there can be French and there can be French and Muslim, and, but I think you have to open him up to a broader context, to the Cold War context. And, and if you go back to the 30s and what you read, it looks superficially like he's saying all the right things about race and, and you know, métissage, and he's a very... But I think it's a little more... It's less interesting and less nuanced than these other people I've been invoking. So that's the long answer to your question. Thanks very much. Um, any further questions? Daniel first. <laughs> no, that's fine. Daniel. Yeah, th- thanks for, for a fascinating talk. I, I, I was amongst the um, crowd in the Sufo watching the pantheonization. Oh, you were. <laughs> I, 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 I'm wondering, do you, do you think that um, Tion's um, role in Algeria was relatively played down during that pantheonization compared to what she did um, during, during the resistance? Um, because although uh, Hollande uh, mentioned in his uh, speech on courage, which the courage to oppose um, torture in Algeria. I'm wondering whether um, that that section was sort of relatively played down because it might be more um, more politically controversial than um, inserting uh, and, and the three hours into the, the wider resistance uh, No, I'm I'm with you. I think I think he said very little about Germain. I think he was at a loss of what to say, and partly because of that he didn't want to bring up the, the Algerian part of her story beyond to, to say that she resisted torture, which is part of, now out there as part of the public, I mean, it's not new in France anymore, everybody can talk about that now, but what, what as I'm sure you know, Hollande did not apologize when he went to Algeria for colonialism, I mean, there's still a, a, a sort of silence around, around Algeria, and I think that... Uh, the, the speech was quite interesting um, in, in that I thought in the fact that it was much easier to talk about all the others than it was to really talk about. But apparently, 
you know, they had no, the whole process came down to 12 people were chosen and then each defender of each hero had to go to the 80s and make a plea for, and, and they were very much wanted, you know, they included Germain Tillon, they liked it. The idea was all four of these people were supposedly somehow connected with the Musée de l'Homme in the Réseau du Musée de l'Homme, uh, which was a stretch because Jean Zé was not really a resistor. I mean, Jean Zé was part of the Popular Front. That was, um, and that's how they made the connection. The Popular Front helped support the opening of the Musée de l'Homme. But. Thank you. Um, yes? Uh, I wanted to, act, to ask a little bit more about some of the background questions, less in the sense of official framework than uh, in the sense of how they each came at anthropology as a choice of the subject to study, and specifically, not just about family backgrounds, but outsider or insider status. Um, Tion was, of course, female, and I wondered how her experience choosing anthropology or ethnology as her subject compared with somebody like Sustel, who actually sounds so much more establishment in his, from what you said, I don't know, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I'm missing something, no, no, no. But, but it sounds like, you know, he goes to London and he joins up with the law, it sounds like, you know, somebody who's very, you know, somebody who came in first year, I guess you can have a certain, and she sounds like she's coming at this from sort of different motivations and perhaps with different experiences mm-hmm. in the process of studying, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about it that, you know, it's hard to know why people make the choices they make and what they think they're getting out of what they're doing, but I guess it's sort of piggybacks with a kind of gender angle on David's question. Well, I think one of the things that came out of the choice of the two women for the Panthéon, um, they were both Catholic, there's a sort of Catholic, perhaps, I mean, if you wanted to read into her motives, not political background, but a kind of, you know, a practicing Catholic from a, an, a certain form of, you know, Christian Charity. I don't know what you would say, you know, beyond that. In term- I, I don't think there was any way of, um, and I, I don't, I haven't read, there's been a lot written about her now, but it's still somewhat fragmentary about her own, her background. She had actually been to, to Germany in the 30s. She'd seen, you know, what was going on. Even though she had no political affiliation, I think she was shocked by what she saw. And she had, so she was fairly... Um, she came from a you know a much more privileged background than Sustel. Sustel came from a working class family. He was sort of a so he was a in some ways a self made person. I, I I tried originally to sort of understand what and this is the cohort that includes Levi Strauss. So he's just not um, he he goes off and does his own thing. And I think if anything, he was brought into ethnology. I mean, he writes in the beginning of *Plus Tropique* that. You know, Jacques Soustel was the first Normanien who, who chose, you know, a new discipline of ethnology, and that sounded fun to me, so I decided to do that too. I mean, and so, and he, he, was, he was doing, he'd done law, you know, and, and this generation, the women, there are many women, many are, are accompany their husbands as ethnographers, so are a little bit overshadowed, but it didn't, it, it, they're very, at least in Denis poem is another very important member of this court, you know, they don't, there's not, they have not talked about their lives and why they made the choice um, of ethnology, so you're sort of trying to piece it together, and it seems to be a post, you know, they're the generation who lives too young to, I mean, they were young adults during World War I, um, university was open to women after the war, and they seem very sort of just searching for something different, and that, that seemed to be how they all described how they made their way to ethnology, a sort of frustration with the old, the old, old sociology, as they were calling, you know, the kind of sociology at this point. And, but also, what, you know, they were just sampling courses, and this is, and then they all talk about being drawn to the, the, the personality of most, you know, once you're in his presence, because nobody could quite tell you what he said in a seminar, you know, the notes didn't add up, but they just knew they were in the presence of, yeah. I've never had this experience. <laughs> what? You said what? <laughs> Where that's considered a, a form of flattery, but they were all, they, they talk about, you know, the shock of a great personality. So, um, 
I do think um, he was a fabulous mentor, and that, of course, you know, this probably, you know, I was reenacting something of, you know, what it what it must was it like to be a grad student, or you know, I mean, there was a, there were familiarities to some of what they were they were writing about in these letters, but I think it's a part of of most of his career that people don't talk about much, you know, because they just say he didn't publish enough, or that you know that but that he invested all this time. And it was the second generation of students that he had, had to train because the first generation that he trained were all killed in World War I. So, so to live through World War II and to see a second generation of students you know, disappear, it's a very, um, it's just a very sad, right, sad story. Any more questions? Yes, yes. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how the stories of these people connect to um, a broader international effort to actively think about race differently after the Holocaust. I was thinking specifically about um, the 1950 UNESCO Statement on Race. And I talked a little bit about UNESCO in the book. And I was wondering if you could kind of tie it to those efforts. Well, actually, that's why I'm thinking of... Uh, I mean, I, I, I first thought I might do something on, on Sustel because there is no good biography, but there are no really... <coughs> I mean, to do something as a style, there are no archives mm-hmm. that exist. I mean, you know, this is even too. Yeah, so the book too, yeah. There's not, so you'd have to do it. And, and he wrote he wrote so much, you just get tired of reading. I mean, he was he read himself endlessly. You know, every year he produced the book, I think, after mm-hmm. the 50s. But I am very interested in the whole trajectory, as you can tell, of, of racism and anti-racism after the war. And I was, I, um, and maybe, you know, that... One way of thinking about it is that, for certainly for France in the French Union, so in Africa, so the colonies it's keeping, it's very important to you know to sell to the world. This came up in some of the talks this morning. How you sell yourself or sell the French Union? You have to sell it as not racist. I mean, you have to prove that you're anti-racist. Credit. So um, that's why I think, and everything you read, as I say, if you just sort of look at Sustel as an anti-racist, you'll find plenty that proves he is. I mean, that's not the problem. It's this other thing, this sort of cultural mm-hmm. evolutionism that is a, a more, it seems to me, it's not a form of racism, but it is a form of not acknowledging the full humanity, and, and certainly for him helps explain, I think, his, his choice to defend the French Union or Algérie Française. And he, he had this image of, of I think, of Algeria, or all of, you know, the France Afrique is going to be the, the Wild West. It's, a, it's very, there's a Vichy element to it. It's going to, our energy is going here, and that will re-energize the nation, and so in a, in, in a he's very anti-NATO, I mean, you know, and breaks with it all. So, I, I think the, the larger trajectory of anti-racism is, is very difficult to periodize for the post-war period. I think it'll, that's one of the things I'm interested in looking at this period, till 62, and then try to figure out what happens after. So there's a turning point, right? Or, 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 or races, or, you know, is the French Union a key, the, the, you know, the creation sort of fits well with what Fred Cooper has been arguing. And, and, but I do think the international context is absolutely critical now. And, and one of the interesting things, I've gone to look at the UNESCO archives and this race bureau, which... I'm not even sure that's the right name for it. You know, I've become very attentive to what word they're using. But one of the things Maitreau says is, he, you know, they're looking for experts on race relations internationally. And they find, you know, there are plenty of Brits, there are South Africans, there are, you know, there are the Swiss. There's nobody in France. He said, there, I can't think of anyone who works on race relations. It's just not a, it's not a tradition. There's, I mean, there's, there's, so I, I'm curious about that. I mean, when does, why in, in Britain and when does it become rooted as a possible, obviously, America too, but, but then you have, a, you know, you have UNESCO sitting in Paris and you have all these race sociologists coming through Paris. It's just a very intriguing moment um, to think about race and anti-racism. Thank you very much. Another really full, fascinating answer that inspires lots of questions from me. Does anyone else want to ask a question? Yes. Um, I was just thinking about you were speaking there about this, this issue of why Tion is one of the that is from Papillon. Um, and it has been suggested that it is perhaps connected to the rehabilitation of Calum as a figure, intellectual figure of France, because Tion's kind of trajectory is very closely intertwined with that of Calum. And now that 
he has been rehabilitated and we can move beyond considerations of the Algerian war which people are either on the right side or on the wrong <laughs> side depending on your political viewpoint um, to what extent is she really representative of the man they couldn't antagonize because the family couldn't let him you mean, uh, you mean Camus? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I I've heard that argument. No, I, I hadn't heard that specifically, but I, I've talked to, um, for example, Alice Kaplan's about to bring out a book on Camus, sort of biography of l'étranger, and I always found her work very stimulating. But I, I you know, and she has said that, that Camus, right, has, has joined, been allowed to join again the sort of... <laughs> I don't know, the pantheon of literature. And I, I, so I've only heard them associated, except Tillon has had an easier time of being reintegrated than, than Camus. So maybe that, you know, that, that's perfectly plausible. I don't know if we can prove it right or if anyone has said that specifically. Or maybe Camus will come. I didn't realize it was his family that his family said he could. Well, it's like because he wanted to, uh, I sort of, um, wants to pantheonize him. And they opposed it, but we don't know whether it was because of the sacrifice. Right. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. So maybe. <laughs> That's very interesting. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has one, if not, I might ask the one myself. If you don't mind, Alice. Um, uh, well, sorry. No, no. You please, please go ahead. What about Ravenbrook? The, uh, the, the, the fact that she was the daughter of the Duke of Marlborough, and she was That's what she says in every sense. Uh, the, the, um, what's often said about, I think, you know, trying to link the 30s to a Rowan's book is that, you know, people say, and it's, it's absolutely true, you know, she was in ethnog she was able to put on her ethnographer's hat and understand how the system worked. I mean, that was her, how she, one of the ways in which she coped with being there is, is a, in, in teaching all the the other women there sort of to think about this as a system, this is why they're doing this and this is how our labor is used. And and I to me it's not so much an ethnographer, it's a histo you know, it's a good critical sort of historian's approach to how things work. And that's that gets back to the sort of training that she had in which, you know, history and ethnography were not um, or history was woven and folded into ethnography. It was not just description of something that didn't change, you know, which is what I often think we we imagine ethnography, or we used to, you know, think ethnography was. But she, she was absolutely, you know, clear that it, it, it taught her. I mean, the scales fell from her eyes, and I'm sure it explains also, you know, what happened in, later on when she went back to Algeria, um, you know, and how she made the, the choices she did, or the refusal to make a choice, as she said, you know, 58. I'm not. Both sides are committing violence. Both sides are, you know. For me, it's, you know, it's life itself that matters, and I'm not going to take sides, but I'm going to try to help my friends on both sides. And that, So for her, that was not a political choice. Other people see it as, as a choice that you make. Uh, but I think that's part of what's, what's made her appealing in the late, you know, late 20th or the early 21st century. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions from the floor, then I think it's time to thank Alice once more. Let's have a